Hello. There aren't many people who can claim to have changed the course of history and created modern gaming culture in the UK as we understand it, but surely amongst those few must count the founders of Games Workshop and the creators of Fighting Fantasy. My guest today is responsible for some of the best, most interesting and most innovative experiences in gameplay storytelling. He has pushed the boundaries beyond anything done before in terms of immersion and technology, using new ways to engage the audience in the adventure. He co-wrote The Warlock of Firetop Mountain with Sir Ian Livingstone and went on to create perhaps the greatest expression of the game book form with the Sorcery series. And he used telephone technology to dial up probably the most exciting adventure ever recorded in fantasy interactive scenarios by telephone. I'm talking, of course, about an individual who created so many stories, so many adventures, and so many games. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm privileged to be in conversation with Steve Jackson. Just before we begin, I wanted to note that due to some of the quirks of the software during our call, there were interruptions and a few technical problems, but I have tried to seamlessly get rid of those using some annotations where I've brought up visual cues of the things that Steve is talking about. Hopefully, you'll enjoy the conversation just as much as I did, and you'll be able to see some of the amazing things that he's created. Steve, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you finding the time to have a chat. Pleasure. So I thought we'd start by maybe just talking about how you and Ian Livingston and John Peake actually founded Games Workshop back in 1975. What was it like at that time and, and what was it like starting a company from scratch? From scratch? Well, the thing is that the three of us were sharing a flat and we all hated our jobs. I mean, Ian was a, working in a marketing department somewhere, uh, an oil company, I think. Uh, John was a civil engineer. And he just started working on the Jubilee line, I think it was. Um, and I was, uh, well, not really doing much at it. John had, had told the, the build, people on the building site that uh, I was a great model maker. Uh, and they needed a model making the top of this building at Petit France. Um, and uh, I was just the person to do it. You know, <laughs> a model maker, I can't do model. Um, but anyway, I had a go, did much better than the guy who was doing it before me. Uh, and they actually used this balsa wood mo model that I built, which was a huge thing, um, to show the engineers what the top of the building is supposed to look like. That was the bit they couldn't get. But with the model to help them, uh, it was good. But then after I stretched that out about as far as I could, which was uh, until October, November time. And then uh, the, the uh, model was finished and it was cold out there on the building site. And I had to find an indoor job quick. Uh, and I ended up selling middle, um, scientific instruments to the Middle East, a company called Gallen Camp. But I can't really say that I, I worked there because this was about the time that we discovered Dungeons and Dragons and it, it was an obsession. Uh, and I used to sit there during the day um, uh, writing out these invoices for, for uh, you know, complete scientific science labs um, and secretly on my lap drawing dungeons. <laughs> <laughs> and they never twigged on that. But then I gave up. I mean, I was the first one to give up because I didn't have a proper job, I had a labouring job. I think. And, uh, and I also... Uh, knew the publisher of Games and Puzzles magazine. And uh, that was a professional magazine at the time, the only one. And I'd gone along to see if there's anything I could do, maybe packing boxes. And it turned out that Graham Levin, who owned the, the company, uh, was desperately looking for people to to join the, the, the games testing panel and other testing panels. And uh, he was glad to have an extra hand on board. So that was good. I remember my first... Um, first uh, game that I ever reviewed was uh, Kingmaker, I think. Um, and that was, it was a terrible example. 
uh, it was a, an English game by an English company, uh, and and yet uh, it was terrible. <laughs> you couldn't play it. The rules were awful. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that that was that, and so eventually uh, we well we had this monumental trip to America to to reach Gen Con, and Ian and I went. John had given up by this time. He, he didn't uh, he didn't really fancy the idea of fantasy games at all. He he was into wooden games. Uh, hence the name Games Workshop. Uh, John had a workshop in his bedroom in this flat in uh, in Shepherd's Bush. And he was getting fed up with that because none of his none of these girls that he brought back would would uh, would stay with him because he had a, a the floor was covered in wood chippings, so he left. Uh, and it was probably a good thing at the time because Ian and I were obsessed with fantasy, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, superheroes, that kind of thing. And John just wasn't really. He like he was a very good craftsman, making um, backgammon sets. And so quite a few, but it was still not uh, how Games Workshop was destined to be as a fantasy game publisher. And then it was a, a number of years later, having created Games Workshop and and done some incredible work to sort of grow the UK RPG market and starting creating your own games. In 1982, you would then publish the Warlock of Firetop Mountain. I mean, what was yeah. the sort of early days of fighting fantasy like? I mean, how, how did it feel sort of pivoting into that kind of space? Yeah, no, I remember it was so proud as every author is, you know, to see, to um, uh, have the, see your, your book published. And I remember on the day it was supposed to have been published, it was sometime in August, I think, in 1982. Uh, I was working from an office in King Street in Richmond and a couple of doors up, there was a the open book was a little... Um, family-owned uh, bookshop, uh, and I, I thought, I wonder if we've got it in. And I went to the back of the shop to the to the children's section, and right down in the corner were two copies of the the uh, All Up a Fire Top Mountain. It was really chuffed to see them in there. I mean, the thing is, that a week later they were still there. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, did it? Was it? No, it didn't sort of sell initially it didn't fly off the shelves right at the beginning did it it take a little well, bit of time to spin up it did yeah the thing is that a pu- penguin or puffin was a children they had a big argument about whether it should be a penguin or a puffin book it was written like a penguin book for adults but the, the, the puffin book club had fifty thousand subscriptions uh and it would be a shame to waste that so they published this pu- a puffin uh, and it turned out well because that that, uh, that that subscription was very instrumental in in producing what was well the sales were just fantastic at the time. Once there were a couple of things that happened, and I think Ian's memory of, is better than mine on what it. Was. One of them was a, an appearance on Radio Four, a uh, Radio One, that which uh, was treated as a live action game by by the uh, disc jockey. Uh, and so he'd have the audience, or the audience, he'd have people from uh, the readership phoning in and say, turning left, turning right. Uh, and it, it was supposed to last for five minutes. It lasted for about half an hour. So uh, we've obviously got something there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that was uh, it was really exciting. Uh, and the first, like you say, they weren't expecting very much. It was 5,000 copies, I think, they had printed of the first, uh, the first edition of warlock and they, they had no idea how it was going to sell it wasn't like a, no other book uh, and luckily for a number of publicity opportunities um they uh they realized they, they'd got a um, bit of a hit on their hands the rest of history they did with this reprinted ten thousand and another twenty thousand it kept on going like that and at the time that um I think Death Trap Dungeon was the was the uh, the most uh, po- most popular release. So I think they sold eighty thousand copies of that in the first week, which was wow. just phenomenal. And yeah, it was parties all around. We got flown out on publicity trips to the Far East and all that kind of thing. So uh, it was exciting, really exciting. Yeah. I'll bet. So it must have been quite different to those early days of Games Workshop when it was kind of a very different, you know, very tough. <laughs> yeah. 
in the back of a van. You see, we we'd gone to Gen Con because we 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 were now sucked in with um, with fantasy games. Uh, we thought we'd go to this convention, this convention called Gen Con it was in Wisconsin, and really. Uh, it, there were probably 150 people there, but but the people that were there represented virtually the entire ho- ho- um, hobby games, fantasy role playing games industry, and we were treated like, um, oh, are you from England? Yeah, are you going to you're going to sell our our books and miniatures? Uh, and they were so chuffed. I mean, a good example of this is that TSR um, had decided. Uh, to that, that we'd be good as a um, distributor for them, but it had no idea that we were running out of a flat. I mean, as far as they were concerned, well, it wasn't exactly a factory or a publishing house or anything, but it was a, a flat in Shepherd's Bush, and uh, it was the, the impression was because we were doing Alan Weasel as well. It, the impression was that this, this is something substantial. So uh, Gary. Uh, Offered us uh, the exclusive, uh, an exclusive distribution arrangement for uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, if for three years, if we would make an order for the for the game, um, fantastic. Well, we we placed an order for the game. It was for six copies. Six copies of the game gave us the exclusive um, European distribution rights. And we were sailing. I mean, that was fantastic. The sales every month were were almost double the one month before. Um, yeah, yeah. And with so much going on in Games Workshop, I, I was, did you have, still have time to play any games? Were you still actually playing D and D at the time? Well, D and D, we we played quite a lot. Really, I mean, we, it was a bit dull for anybody who wasn't into D and D at the time. We were subjected to a play this game it's fantastic well it's not actually a game what, what do you do you, you don't win there's no winning and losing and that kind of so uh we had to explain it to all our friends uh and most of them bought copies of Dungeons and Dragons but probably never played them uh but it was it was obvious there was something something brand new in in the wings there uh and people did get quite up about it and we used to have um sessions around at the flat and uh the, the flat turned into a bit of a Shop. Uh, after we come back from Gen Con, we had nowhere to live because we'd we'd um, packed all our wares, all our stock, into the back of my van. I had a van that I used for, for a, um, I had a vegetarian restaurant uh, with my sister who lived in Brighton. We had a van, packed everything into the van, and then um, when we came back from Gen Con, we had um, to do something with all the stock in the van. <laughs> And um, we we had nowhere to live. We had nowhere to have a, an office. Uh, and these things came along. I think we got our, our flat for six pounds a week. I think it was something like that. <laughs> for, the, for the two of us, Ian and um, John had left by now. Um, and yeah, we found we found that we found the estate agents who we were. Uh, Ninety seven Oxbridge Road was behind the estate agents and people used to come along expecting to see a shop and find out there was a bread bin about half the size <laughs> of this room and we had uh one employee trevor graver who was our first employee and he was basically set to um uh, to do mail orders to handle mail orders and if any customers came in uh, you know, they walk around in astonishment. The place was so small, and uh, if they came in, Trevor and Ian and I uh, had to leave <laughs> to make room for them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I remember we had this little layout of, of, in strings of wood with lots of um, min- uh, lots of mini figs. But eventually the, the estate agents decided they wanted this room that they let out to us back again. And we said, that's fine. Just um, find us a new place, your estate agent. Uh, and they did. And the, the, it was 97 Uxbridge Road. Um, and that was our, uh, yeah, no, that was our base for about two years, I suppose. And that, that was like a proper, uh, uh, a proper shop, you know, with, with space for 
for uh, stock and uh, little areas where you could play. Um, and that was amazing to see because we we did this sort of, we did this uh, launch thing where, where um, the first person to to buy a copy of Dungeons and Dragons on a certain Saturday morning um, got it for ten p instead of six pounds ten pence. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Do you know we were we were so um, kind of obsessed? No, no, we're not really as obsessed with that. But we wanted to be as fair as possible, so we'd taken the exchange rate with dollars and worked it out precisely. To what it was and what it would catch, what it would um, cost if we were to buy them in pounds, and so we came back with six pounds ten. <laughs> anyway, the person that they, who um, won the prize for the first um, Dungeons and Dragons had arrived the night before. It was it was um, it was a Friday night. Uh, and we had somebody from, I think, m military modelling or something that we were doing uh, interviews with. Um, and this this character just sort of parked himself outside the, the door. And uh, we thought, what's he doing here? You know, so it never occurred to us that actually he, he was a customer and he was after that Dungeons and Dragons and he stayed there all <laughs> night wait, waiting up for Dungeons and Dragons for uh, 10 pence <laughs> and Empire of the Petal Throne was another one that was that was not quite so popular as d, &D but uh, that was a great price of 1694 I think it was right yeah. which I'm guessing was a fair a fair whack well, at it was the time. a lot of money yeah no yeah. I mean it was would we dare uh, spend that much you know price them up that far but then we had Dungeons and Dragons setting, uh, selling at a um, at a reasonable price, and then this Empire of the Petal Throne, um, which soon dropped out of there. Mm. I mean, they started pu publishing all sorts of different types of books. But this is TSL Hobbies now, and the company that uh, don't, Gary Gygax was. Uh, I think he owned it. I don't, it was very strange the way they only ship of TSL went. I've just been reading up on it actually, yeah. and it was it was gradually it got taken over more by uh, Kevin and Brian Bloom, um, and they started installing. I think they had a majority shareholding them, something like that, and they were bringing in um, more of the Bloom family, and it all seemed a bit sort of. Yeah. They they did actually offer us a, a deal where we would be taken over or actually it was a merge a merger they would merge with games workshop and uh, we'd get a, a, a chunk of stock which seemed quite generous at the time i have to say um but the, the politics were not so good they sent this guy called al saunders uh, over to check up on us and see what uh whether he thought we were any, you know, worth the money or whatever. And this, we picked him up from the airport and he was this guy that looked like meatloaf. It was just huge. Um, and he, he tried to take him round the West End. Uh, he couldn't get out of, the, of Ian's car without being pushed from the inside. Um, and all it seemed that he was interested in doing was selling doggy thermometers. He, he was like a an opportunist a trader i suppose what you might call it that uh, he traveled around the world or particularly the far east and um uh and, and then uh, bring stuff you know to america and he, at that particular time he was uh he was trying to flog these doggy thermometers <laughs> anyway games workshop didn't become a doggy thermometer um, <laughs> retailer <laughs> Have you ever sold any of them? Uh, anyway, this, this this was quite a tense t time for us because they'd set a, t a time limit on it as when the th when the three months, uh, the three year, um, European exclusive came up for. Yeah, because they there was a period there where you didn't have the exclusive rights, but you were still selling D and D, wasn't there? Well, you know the, the big mistake that they made. There were two of them actually. They they. Um, they 
John Turnbull was going to be running it, and they brought. They said, "Okay, you need a car as well." So, and he bought a Jaguar for him, uh, and apparently TSL didn't like that at all because in America Jaguars are much more expensive mm. um, than they are in the UK, um, and so that was uh, that was a bit of a no-no spending that much on a car. Uh, but the other thing is, and this is a business decision, that they all they had to do was cut us off as, you know, not suppliers at wholesale prices. Because what, what happened was most of the customers just, um, they just kept on ordering from us. Yeah? We, right. we had White Dwarf, we had, we could do Dungeons and Dragons. We, the margins were lower on, on D&D for us. Um, but it was... Um, still it was doable and we had all this extra stuff so we really didn't notice much of a change in sales you know, at all it kept on growing and had they just said okay you're only going to get retail margins now um then that would have really hurt because everybody else would have to go to tsr mm. to buy their dungeons and dragons um and they didn't do it it was good kept games workshop going we'd already decided we were going to um we were going to publish our own games and that was really where the empire strikes back british empire mm. strikes back came about we picked out four games that we knew and did a big number about making them british games uh british games and we got uh what did we, we got the British Empire Strikes Back was the slogan, mm. and it was really quite quite neat. And just at the time that it was, we, we'd got uh, approached by George Lucas Company to saying cease and desist because the the advert going into the back, going through space in the background, mm. and uh, I don't think it was quite successful actually. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. I mean, you mentioned White Dwarf there as well, because that was something that you and Ian were were also running during that that whole period as well. I mean, that just how were you able to do all of that simultaneously? <laughs> it seems like a lot a lot of work. Yeah, no, it was a lot of work actually. We we didn't publish it monthly to start off with. We published it fortnightly, uh, so not fortnightly. Um, so every other month, wasn't it? But by, by, by month, yeah, 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 that's right. Um, but uh, yeah, no, yeah, the White Dwarf was kind of Ian's. Uh, he he came back from. Well, at the time, we'd been uh, working from that sh uh, bread bin shop uh, around the back of the estate agents, um, and and we uh, uh, he he came back. We were working from the flat as well. And uh, Ian came back one day and said, I've got an idea. What do you think of this? We're going to upgrade Owl and Weasel, which was our little fanzine that we did. Um, and it was like a mini magazine, but it was all sort of, uh, it was it was um, yeah, on a small scale. And he said, uh, right, we, we, what we want to do is turn Owl and Weasel into a proper magazine. And uh, let's let's take the plunge and do it. So we did it about how much it was going to cost and how many copies we needed to sell to break even and that sort of thing. And uh, it was, I think it was uh, pretty much universally accepted that we'd have a go with this and just, you know, make sure we we uh, we do it. And then it's, it was worked out well because the people who uh, took uh, White Dwarf, uh, Alan Weasel, they all um, took... Uh, uh, White Dwarf as well, and the shop started selling White Dwarf. I mean, he couldn't really sell through uh, uh, Alan Weasel through shops because uh, it was too amateurish, really. But uh, White Dwarf caught everybody's attention. At the White Dwarf, uh, which is White Dwarf Star, and also a, a fantasy character with white skin, uh, and it's still there. After I don't know how many copies have, have been sold now. I think the circulation must be about. 50, 60,000, mm. something like that. Although it has changed a lot. It, when when we were in charge, we, we liked role-playing games primarily, but also other games as well. You know, um, We had no ambitions to take over all the different 
types of game. Um, uh, but some, after some time with Brian being in charge, he decided that he didn't want uh, the rest of the the, uh, um, the rest of the content. He's only interested in the Warhammer stuff, mm. and the whole uh, magazine became a Warhammer magazine. Uh, well, it was sort of oh goodness. You think this is a wise idea? It's just to work on uh, just publish stuff about one game. Well, you know, there we are, fifty thousand or sixty thousand or whatever it is now. It's definitely the right decision. <laughs> yeah, because you worked quite closely with Brian Ansel for a period of time there. Once he'd come in to co-found Citadel and to to work with Games Workshop, under Games Workshop, under you and Ian, and sort of expanding that side of the business. What was it like working with Brian Ansel during that, that period? Brian was in and out and in and out like a <laughs> but I had to say all the drawers. But um, he, uh, he didn't think he was being uh, getting a fair um, cut of the, the budget, the Games Workshop budget. Um, he, he thought that the, the miniatures were making more money, so they ought to get more and more of the cash that was spread out. At the time, we were a bit concerned because we'd gone through, we'd got retail shops going, and we'd gone in for um, some deals with the big boys, like, like Sinclair Spectrum, um, Waddington's Games, Parker Brothers, as they were. Uh, and they, they were offering de deals where you didn't, you take the stock in January, but you didn't have to pay for it till December. Mm. And that sounded like a fantastic deal, uh, all that, a, a year's credit. So we bought and we overbought. And at the end of, a, at the end of the uh, December, when the payment was due, suddenly, uh oh, it's a bit worrying. Uh, but anyway, we saw through that. Uh, and uh, yeah. It's good. Yeah. And then obviously having created the fighting fantasy books and now you're not just running games workshop, you're also writing an increasing number of fighting fantasy books. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it certainly seemed to be quite a sort of, there was a period of significant change there. It sounds like. Well, it wasn't a good time for us to be having girlfriends. That's for a start. <laughs> because we were just, all it was. I mean, it wake up at about seven thirty, drive into uh, workshop, which was probably half an hour's drive. Um, spend a day there, jump in the car, get back home, typewriter out, and uh, continue what we were what we were writing before. Uh, and you, you couldn't stop, uh, and you couldn't go on really. I mean, <laughs> I, I think uh, the girlfriends didn't do well. <laughs> but we were just stuck, you know. What could we do? We couldn't do less. Uh, actually, strangely enough, we never lost any of our relationships at the time. <laughs> that's, that's surprising. <laughs> we were the first nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Is that there? Yeah. One of the fighting fantasy books that I, I wanted to talk to you about was the the House of Hell. Uh, so the, the mm. horror fighting fantasy book that you wrote is really the only one in that genre that was sort of truly in that genre. I just wondered where the the idea came from to explore a horror story in fighting fantasy. I, I remember thinking I, at the time, Ian was extending the Alencia series of books and using the same characters to link them all together and that sort of thing. It's a good idea. And uh, I was a bit more, um, well, I didn't like the idea of just doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, even Ian himself had said there's only so many things you can do in a dungeon. <laughs> and he uh, he extended that, whereas I was looking for new areas to, to go. So Sorcery came along because Sorcery was, well, that was like a personal favour to one of the editors, Geraldine Cook, who uh, I don't, she discovered Fighting Fantasy. She was the one originally... Um, got in touch and pushed it on Penguin and finally said yes. But then they probably had the books published by Puffin, so he got none of the acclaim for it, which I thought that was a bit unfair. So I pro always promised him I'd do something a bit more um, adulty 
and that's where sorcery came in. And I, I have no idea how I managed to do so it was about a thousand references, maybe more than that. No, it's, it's right, 800, was it? Crown of Kings, so the rest of them, she's must have been 2,000. Two um, yeah. So the, that that was one, uh, an adulty book, which uh, suited suited um, more mature players. Uh, I tried uh, superheroes, uh, a point with fear. Um, House of Hell, or Starship Traveller was the first one, that was a science fiction one, and that was based entirely on uh, Star Trek. Star Trek was one of my f favourite programmes at the time, and so that's, it was all based on that. Uh, and then after that it was House of Hell, like you say, and it's House of Hell, well, I, I had an obsession, I wouldn't call it a, an obsession, but uh, we really liked horror films, and so why not do something? And what came out was pretty much what you'd expect from a schlock um, uh, horror film, you know, along the lines of the Hammer films, which I used to watch. Uh, and, and I, yeah, it was, it, I don't know whether you'd say it particularly innovative, but it was a typical uh, horror story, you know, the car breaks down in the middle of the night, it's pouring with rain, uh, where can you get some shelter, a spooky old house that's um, just not far from where you broken down and then you get uh, uh, invited in uh, and then you get to do uh, some, of the, some of the stuff that uh, generally goes on there's a sacrifice in there actually that's interesting the, the sacrifice we, we had to there was an illustration in there of a um, a, a victim on a sacrificial table and uh, they, they wouldn't let us leave leave that bit in. They have to paint out the areas of the new victim um, before they let it uh, go through. It didn't really didn't really matter that much. And uh, I thought I've never done done another one since a horror one. I don't know how you. Uh, yeah, interesting. Never thought about. Never really thought about doing another one. Um, but I suppose that would be. The one to do something that um, tacks on to the House of Hell because mm. that has been. I mean, I said De Death Trap Dungeon has been the most um, uh, successful, I guess, successful um, non-fantasy, mm -hmm. and uh, House of Hell probably is the next one. Yeah, yeah, anyway. that was great. I mean, the the other thing that, or amongst the many projects that you and Ian undertook, at sort of tied to fighting fantasy, were the the puzzle quests. So you did the uh, tasks yes. of Tantalon, and and Ian did the task of Souls. Um, yes, I've yes. recently been trying to tackle the task of Tantalon. <laughs> oh dear, yeah, <laughs> and well, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is tough. Yeah, and the the, the thing is, I always thought. Um, uh, with uh, the the model for this was Masquerade by Kit Williams, mm. um, who has been going for I don't know a year or something, and nobody had found the rabbit. Uh, that just to fill in that, that Kit Williams did this puzzle book that looked like Tassatan's Ta Lana Casket of Souls. It was hidden somewhere in the UK, and you have to try and find where it is. Well. Jeez, I mean, the UK is a big place, and, and he didn't make it. it. It was a really interesting book, uh, and that there was a yeah, sure. I mean, I can't deny the influence there. Mm. Uh, but these little different puzzles, um, and I actually enjoyed designing these puzzles. I mean, they're not all completely new, but uh, it was quite good fun. I remember we came down. We had a shop in um, Glasgow, another one in Edinburgh. And we were just coming down on the train from, from the Edinburgh shop. And we'd been talking to David Fickling, who was a, an editor at Oxford University Press. He was really keen on doing this colour version. And we'd been talking before about how about we do a colour book. And most publishers would say too expensive and never sell. Um, but he was keen to do it. And uh, it took some res risks. Tessa Templon ended up selling quite well, and, and 
I don't know how many people actually got it. I did a, a published a, a little booklet that looked a bit more like Owls and a Weasel. Um, and uh, he, uh, he he liked the, the way it's come out, and uh, it was a good format. It was about three years later that Ian McKay finally came back with um, Casket of Souls, which was the Ian's version. But uh, I say, I, I did this little... Um, if I, if I can find one, I'll, I'll send you a copy if you like. It was called The Solution to Tests of Tensalon. <laughs> uh, they probably sold about five or six hundred of them at the time. Um, yeah, years. I think that's essential stuff because there's some some of the puzzles are quite tricky, I, I'm finding so far. <laughs> I can I can help you out with one or two if you, you can. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I might have to give you. I might have to put put down my notes and uh, and fire them over, and you can correct me and tell me where I'm going wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a fascinating book, and it, just on the actual production of it, did you? Because obviously, it's so it's so visual. All of those puzzles. Did you design the puzzles and and sort of specify the brief and say, here's what this page needs yeah. to look like, and here's how the puzzle should be intro sort of part of the yeah. art yeah. it had to be done and i have to say and i don't think stephen would um will object to it that uh, when i when he finally delivered all the the um, manuscripts i mean i'd i'd scribbled stuff on um on paper and you know given him briefs and that sort of thing uh but he was a very like what you call a, a factual writer he's an um, artist he um yeah, he he uh, like the uh, for example, there's one which is a uh, there, there was one which was the hag witch, um, and she's got a certain number, but some of them are a certain number of hag witches, and they have to be, uh, counted, and there's a count a couple of them that are a bit difficult to count uh, because what I'd re realised at the time is that if you uh do a book like kit williams and you go to all that trouble of making it beautiful to to play you know work of art um if, if somebody solved it within two months you've got no product left anymore and then mm. the sales stopped and everything so you had to make uh, the, the puzzle is quite difficult to do because if you give it away too cheaply i mean ian mckay quit. it was ridiculous was it so there was one that he did, which was a, a little tiny ring um, that was in the illustration, and it was furry sort of thing. So it was a, um, and uh, this was known as the red hair ring, red hair ring. So mm. If you look up, <laughs> uh, okay. And the, the one that I uh, was particularly pleased with was, um, well, the first one was a good one, actually. That was a that was an old puzzle. Uh, and that was rescue Sir somebody. And uh, you have to decide whether to pull or push this lever. Yeah. And when we push, push it one way, it lowers Sir Lancelot into the pit, uh, the fiery pit. And if you push it the other way, it raised him out of the pit. And that was that worked well. I thought we did a great job with that. But there were things like that. The, the um, what else was in there? There was a map that had to be solved, and that's yeah. I mean, I can't yeah, really go through all of them, but it was sure. <laughs> to uh, help if you get stuck on particular ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean the the Hagwitch one. It's it's interesting you mentioned that because I thought that I I've done that one. And I no. thought this maybe is a bit too easy because I feel like I've I've got this, but I suspect now that you've mentioned it, there's maybe some hidden hag witches that I've not found uh, that are hidden away. Uh, well, so I might need to read that one. They're, they're all fairly hidden. I think mm. there's nothing where you could say, "Oh bloody hell!" Who <laughs> <laughs> uh, solved that one? But um, yeah, that was good. And it got bit printed in Japanese. I have no idea. You could do with it, turn it into Japanese. I mean, so these were visual puzzles, not not just um, uh, text puzzles. The uh, that what I started to tell you about the trip from down from Edinburgh 
mm. on the train. On that train, on that journey, I got, I got 10 of the 12 problems, puzzles. To, which, so that really started things off. And the good thing about Stephen Lavis was that he would he could deliver on time. Because he had okay. was hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful bloke, he's a, he's a very nice bloke. But uh, just try and get him. I, I used to think that when he was doing the um, uh, the, the Ian's uh, monsters and things, and there's some really brilliant uh, fantasy uh, illustrations there. And he used to think that if he had a deadline, that was when that was the day when he'd actually start working <laughs> on a piece of art. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Actually, there's another one that the um, the, there's a food chain that uh, you have to follow through. Um, I don't know whether you remember that one, but with the fish one eats that with the fish. Yeah, this yeah. one eats that one eats that one eats that one, all going down the chain. And, and uh, I thought that was quite a neat one. Yeah, but the trouble is all the all the fish. Look like normal fish in a fishmonger, you know. It's really, <laughs> you know, butch uh, with huge claws and things like that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> to be, but yeah. it was good. Yeah. So, as you continue producing the Fighting Fantasy books and Games Workshop's going from strength to strength, and Citadel is growing within Games Workshop, there came a time when. You and Ian Livingston decided to step away, essentially, and hand over the reins to Brian Ansell. And I sort of wondered what that, what your sort of reflections are on that now, looking back so many years later, and sort of thinking about how you might have felt at that time. What was it? What was it like during that? I, the thing about it was um, that they, um, we, we just couldn't keep on going like this. I mean, we we'd have this routine with coming, getting up, going into work. To, workshop and coming back in the evening and sitting typing and a girlfriend's a, you know glad to see us I was going back to the typewriter um not much fun for them and we were also off being offered as I said before you know publicity stories uh, around the far east and um Australia and all sorts of uh, things uh and it was a difficult decision to make but at the time we had uh, guarantees with the bank uh, and all that sort of stuff um, and we decided you know would, Brian would be a perfect person to take over because as he rightly pointed out the, uh, the most it was the Citadel that was making the most profits see and um, I, and we just felt that we sort of needed a break uh, and that's what we did. We had a break. Um, of course, looking back now, and the company is, is that went went the war hammer way, and value is valued at oh goodness knows what it's valued at now, billion pounds or something like that. Poof. <laughs> but uh, but that was a long way off the way it was at the time, and uh, yeah. It, it seemed quite reasonable the, mm. the man that we the, the charge. and there was a you know um then we we kept some of the shareholding back and but um brian did a good job um and sadly no longer with us the last couple of months i think he is he's uh passed over mm. uh, anyway yeah yeah he, yeah, he I mean, did a really good job with with uh, Citadel and uh, deserved the success he got. Well, and the team as well. He had a good team. With. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, was it just looking at how Games Workshop changed? Obviously, it did become so focused on Warhammer and get so focused on the sort of miniature side of things. It's it's a far it's a big change from where you started it uh, with the focus more on, well, even the, the wooden games and then the role-playing games. Did, is it sort of, did you expect or, or sort of envisage that kind of journey for the company at any point? Or was it just, has it been interesting to see it unfold and go in that direction? Well, it has. Yes. It, it, to see, see um, what could be done with games workshop, 
give them uh, the determination, I think, and uh, and the ability to manage it, you know. And then we would never, well, I don't know, we probably would have done, but um, uh, we would never have thought of done doing the whole thing over to Warhammer. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think we'd ever have done that uh, because we we wanted to, our shops to stock all games and uh, it went like, it went like that. So yeah, they did well out of it. We did well out of it, and some time later, all the the uh, investors did well well out of it. Uh, I wonder what's, where it's going next. Mm. Yeah, certainly continues on that that upward trend. It seems like that that yeah, growth trend. Yeah, Think, thinking maybe that you know who who would be uh, a suitable purchaser hmm. for a Games Workshop now, or or would I suppose the thing that next would have been uh, Warhammer computer games hmm. because they tried that earlier on, and I remember thinking uh, um, it's a risky. Thing. So I, w I was working with Lionhead at the time, so I knew how risky this whole thing was. And uh, I, I said, you know, get somebody else to finance it, basically. <laughs> um, which, which I think they did. And I think they, um, uh, they've got other things going there as well, haven't they? Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And looking into movies and TV and, and all sorts of stuff in that sort of space. But yeah. it's interesting. You mentioned the sort of the, the computer games evolution, I suppose, because there's not not quite a computer game, but you did take your storytelling approach. You sort of choose, choose your game book, choose the next adventure uh, sort of approach into the technological realm when you created Fist. So your uh, uh, yeah. fantasy inter interactive uh, yeah. scenarios by telephone. Yeah, I mean, yeah. unfortunately, I missed out on those when they were first around. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about those, if you could reflect on creating the the phone-based yeah. game book. Well, I, I, I remember at the, at the time that a uh, computer company that had what they had that was unique was that this is before the... Uh, t digital dialing where uh, it would click it would count the number of clicks on a rotary dial telephone so you know you, you, you switch it around and you go click 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 mm. and because it could pick up the, the numbers one two zero that made it specially good for uh, uh, use as, a, as a, a games platform and the, the there was a company called computer dial that had this technology and there uh this was a company that was, uh, was owned by the head of or the ex-head of uh chrysler motors i think in america one of the big motor companies and he, he'd sort of left to start a business off with his his sons two sons uh and they were putting this together when one of the, their friends had told them hey you're going to check out this book series because um they they're um doing really well and so um yeah so it was it was almost like we, we, we were supposed to be um doing a fantasy version or uh, of uh, i think number 26 so we're all geared up for this uh, number 26 on uh was going to be fist or it was going to be something or mm. just going to be called um and, and I took it over as a project uh, and suddenly realized that you, you can't do it like this. You can't um, have, you know, two minutes of speech and then uh, and then make a decision and then another three minutes of speech. Because I mean, apart from anything else, people were paying by the, by the um, minute. But mm -hmm. um, that, was the, that was the deal. That was what it was. You know, there was a, a prize on, on sale. There were prizes available to the monthly winners, um, so, and it was almost like somebody had uh, given me a pack of cards and said, oh, "We've got these these things, these card things, um, and you can use them for all sorts of different things. How about using them for um, they're 
government for um, fortune telling. And that's what they did. R Russell Grant was an astrologer at the time, and he, he was doing a deal with them. He, he people would um, dial in their birth dates, and he'd read out their their horoscopes. Um, and it was to, to think about having this platform to to um, do um, uh, cards, games with them. Uh, that was absolutely. Uh, fantastic. I mean, the vision was was there, and, and I say we we I did the first one, and wasn't sure how it was going to work at all, and it turned out to be a great success. And I, I was happened to be living in Spain at the time, and I remember my mother uh, phoning me up and saying, "Oh, we just had the first royalty check in, and it was it was it was an awful lot." <laughs> she was very chuffed with that, and finally. <laughs> Something that's funny. I was doing something that she approved of. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, that went on. Uh, I remember the, 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 the sequence where they, they put it on the back on the TV page of the Daily Mirror just to see how it would go. And that uh, that one did five, took 5,000 calls in a day. So they, about a week later, they went on the back page of The Sun. You can't get any bigger than that, and got seven and a half thousand, I think seven and a half thousand calls, and the computer dial you know, chaps were, you know, were phoning me up. Oh, this is great! You've got to do more of them, that kind of thing. Uh, and I did, and uh, I did three fantasy ones and one um, gladiators one, mm -hmm. which was a match your buddy and and um, slaughter. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, how long yeah. were they? So, if I if I were to complete Fist, the the first adventure, like what was the total length of time it would take me to get to the end? Yeah. No, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether it's uh, it's it's ever been tried. Well, somebody's tried it because they were paying out in gold sovereigns. So somebody. Sure. I would have thought something like uh, I don't know. Half an hour, right? Maybe, maybe a bit longer than that. But you, I can guess... save, you can save your your um, game. There's a, a revolutionary thing there. You can save your game. <laughs> <laughs> how how did that work? Do you remember how that actually worked? That you could say was it you were given a code to dial in next time? Yeah, yeah, right. That's right. And it could connect you with um, uh, with the computer that ran it, and uh, it, yeah. you could. Um, jump back in where you left out mm. yeah that's amazing and i guess because you had multiple with it like different options and choices as well so w how much did you have to write and record for each one? Oh, a lot there was a lot of just um uh, just uh, just digging out the old tapes um from fist and i've got most of them i think so you can see how what how we've got um, how much we've got left on it because tape goes um it uh tape uh de degenerates mm. yeah i suppose because is that the only archive sort of copies of some of those as well yeah and some of them never made it i think the gladiators one which was quite good fun um they uh they, they, they never made it. I don't know. See, the computers I were taken over by Ladbrokes, and all Ladbrokes were interested in is online gambling. Right. And these games that I was doing, yeah, they got a good five year run out of them, I think, and I did, did very well out of them. Hmm. But uh, it wasn't something Ladbrokes felt inclined to keep on going. But the, the lucky thing was that they saved most of the tapes. Uh, so I was able to take the tapes out and you know, perhaps do something with them. Yeah, which is is actually happening now as well, isn't it? Because Sound Realms recently announced that they're bringing the first Fist adventure back. Is that right? That's what, what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's yeah. I, I don't quite know what they've got in mind for for this. Uh, it should work fine if the, if the tapes are all there 
Mm. And I remember the engineer saying, if you if you store the tapes one way, you, you wind it up on a reel one way, um, it will degenerate after a few years. And if you do it backwards, it'll it'll stay perfect. Right. Um, so that's what we're trying. Okay. Great. Yeah. So is that and that's likely to happen in the in the in the near future, hopefully, to to sort of be yeah. back and out there. Yeah. Depends. I don't know quite how they how they work, but uh, I would have thought you know six months or something. Yeah. yeah. I'm very excited because now I'll finally get to try best yeah, yeah. for real for myself. Yeah. yeah. Well, me too, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> the uh, the other thing I just wanted to to ask you as a sort of final question, Steve, was just that in uh, Dice Man and a couple of other places, I think it's mentioned that your favorite game or one of your favorite board games was The Warlord uh, by Mike Hayes, and I know that was one of those initial Games Workshop board games that was sort of re redesigned to be Apocalypse and was released in that. British Empire Strikes Back as well that you mentioned. Yeah, I, I just wondered if there were any other favourites that you've had over the years, any games that have really captured your imagination. We're just looking at uh, on the, the wall behind, right? A copy of Warlord, uh, but I think it's higher. Higher might be. Uh, 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 uh. Do you want me to get it? No, that's I all right. Can see the red box. It's, that's, that's all it is—a red box. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I preferred the original one because it was um, it was pure and un unadulterated. I mean, then he 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 done things like introducing city areas and uh, uh, different things with the capitals. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just funny so, uh, a few weeks. I've got various games get you know, uh, games groups that I uh, play with. Most of the days of the week, actually, and we did try and um, we we did try and play Warlord, uh, which was quite quite difficult because uh, nobody had the same passion that I had about it. It didn't mean anything to to them like that. I mean, they all agreed it was a, a good uh, it was a good game, and it was the I think it was the best selling game in the in Empire Strikes, Strikes Back, um, but. Uh, yeah. Were there any yeah. others that have, have given well, you that same level of passion and excitement? Oh, that's what you asked me, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me are there any other games like that? Ride, right, die, tribe on Warlord. Um, <laughs> the I'd say the one that that I always think of is, is number three. Um, is Civilization. Civilization, either the online, uh, well, the online, the computer game, or the board game. Uh, that was just a fantastic game, and the, the research that had gone into it. I mean, jeez, it was brilliant. Um, so that's my number three. <laughs> right. Well, mm. What's your number two? If you if you'd be willing to share. Oh no, that was Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Okay. Yeah. They should both be joint number one, I think. <laughs> I, can't, you... I, mean, I can't see Dungeons and Dragons being second to the Warlord. <laughs> Do you still play any D and D these days? I haven't played D and D for a long time. Usually, it's it's you just show people how to play it. I mean, it's uh, and, and there's such a variety in what you can do. With uh, the D and D rules and things, hmm. but uh, no, I haven't played for quite some time a role playing game. But uh, I still like my, war my board games, hmm. computer games. Fantastic, yeah. that's great. Well, I I really appreciate you taking some time out, Steve, to talk to me about your experiences creating Games Workshop and fighting fantasy and all of the amazing stuff that you've done. So thank you for all of that and for giving us all of these amazing games and for, for chatting to me. Yeah, no, a pleasure to chat to you. Yeah, that was very easy, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, just wow. I cannot believe that I got that experience. It was incredible to talk to Steve. Thank you, Steve, for taking the time to share so many memories and experiences with me. It was truly a joy and a 
<laughs> just an incredible opportunity. So thank you so much. If you want to support the work I do here on the channel, then you can check out my Patreon, my Ko-fi and my Discord. And you can use my Element Games affiliate links when you go and buy all of your hobby goodness, because that really helps support me too. Check out all of those via the links in the description. I've also included a link to the Sound Realms recreation of Steve Jackson's Fist that is coming soon. So you can check that out and keep track of it as it develops. Thank you once again to Steve. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. Yeah.